Welcome back, episode number 14, Podcasting on a Plane, and this one's about choosing the right school and the right instructor with my friend Mark Dean, because my friend Mark, he just finished his private pilot certificate, and he's he's a really sharp guy, and he's more than a little excited to have just turned that ticket, uh, so inf- excited, in fact, that he went out and he bought himself an airplane already, but hey, it was not easy for him to get there, you know, it never really is, but he had a lot of common issues, and the questions he had that he talked to me about were things like, is a Part 141 type school a good fit for me? What about a flying club? Should you buy an airplane and hire an instructor to teach you in your own plane? What about flying clubs? I mean, are they the Wild West, or can I get good training there? Are flight schools too rigid? Well, the answer to those questions are, I don't know. It just depends on you. But the conversation you're going to hear is one that plays out every single day in the flight training arena. And that's it. It's just a conversation. But for those of you that have struggled with how best to finish your flight training or you know how to get over a slump or a learning plateau, you'll probably be nodding along with us as we talk. And for those of you who are very much entrenched in your flight training journey, I hope that you're going to pick up something that will really help you out. So don't read too much into it. It's just two guys having to talk about reality. But, you know, this is the nitty-gritty stuff that happens everywhere. And I hope that hearing how a really sharp and pragmatic guy navigated his situation to great success will help you out. And if you need more, contact me. Uh, you can go through podcasting on a plane slash contact, or you can just email me or comment on social media, however you want to do it. But we can set up a coaching session or something like that to help you figure out a plan of action for yourself. Now, Mark and I, we met for the first time when he was on a self-guided tower tour. Yeah, that's right, self-guided, and we're going to get to that. He came up, and he had all sorts of really good questions. And at the time, he was pre-solo, and he was having some gut feelings that things weren't really going right when it came to his training. Now, I was really busy working local control, and I could hear, though, in the background that he needed some mentorship. And once I was relieved from the position, I was able to strike up a really good conversation as we walked down the stairs. Now... As we talked, I felt like his frustrations were really, really common. As a matter of fact, I know they're really common because I've had or overheard this exact same conversation more times than I can count. And I told him that. So we agreed to meet a few more times and help him figure out what was the right course of action for him. And you're going to hear about what he decided as you listen to the conversation. And as you might already know, the private pilot completion rate is abysmal. And what I'm talking about is the ratio of people who start flight training versus those who actually see it through to completion. Why? Well, countless articles have been written about this in in all the major aviation magazines, AOPA in particular. uh, They're very interested in in improving the ratio of starters to finishers when it comes to private training. And and, uh, they set up, what, the You Can Fly campaign where uh, they got with uh, Aviat Aircraft to reimagine the Cessna 152 and the 172. They have rusty pilot seminars to help get lapsed pilots back in the air. And the list goes on. But has it helped? Well, I don't know. I hope so. And, And time will tell. But I'm pretty sure the best way to navigate through any tough situation like this is by having a mentor. And that's just what Mark needed. So staying true to my 2018 plan, like I talked about last time, here's another episode very quick after the last one. But it's a bit less formal than the ones you're used to. And I hope that's okay, because I'd like to continue on with stuff like this. So what you're going to hear is just a conversation between two guys, but it's about as real as it gets. Anyway, happy 2018. Thank you guys for listening again, and enjoy the talk. When you came, were you with someone when we came over? Were you with an instructor or did you just like get sent over to the tower? I forgot. Oh, I just went to the tower. Okay. Yeah. I asked them at, at the flight school if they, um, how, how, how I got to take it, how, if I could take a t- tour of the tower because I was, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, in the process of training and listening to somebody talk on the tower, I'm like, what is it that is going on over there? You know? And I was like, I really should see the other side of this thing. So absolutely. I wish more people would do that. Uh, which was actually a great experience. It really helped me to understand like what, what you guys were dealing with that. I'm like, Oh man, there's a lot of stuff moving around up here. <laughs> absolutely. Was it what you thought it was going to be? No, no, no. How was it, it? How was it different from what you thought? Um, it was definitely a little bit more, it was definitely more intense. Uh, there was definitely, uh, it was just, it was a lot busier and more going on. And, um, I don't know. It was just, it was really interesting. It, it was really fascinating actually when we started talking because you were still, you know, managing the traffic that was going on. Now I know it wasn't a really busy day, but I was just floored that you could pay attention to what's going on with all those planes. And then you're still talking to me a little bit, you know, explaining to me what was going on. And, um, the one thing that I remember specifically was one guy had called in, uh, with really, really bad broken English and he said something and then you told him something back, you know, oh, do this or, or whatever. And, and I'm sitting there like, 
and then and then after you were done talking to him and you said, well, clearly I have no idea what the hell he said, but based on where he is and what he's doing, he says, I know where he wants to go. And so I was like, wow, that's impressive right there. And was I right? You were right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You were exactly right. Yeah. yeah it's, and it's, I'm, I'm sitting there going like, I have no idea what that guy said. Yeah. I, it, it's a sixth sense. You kind of pick up and you're, you're just, I don't know. It's, it's a feeling more than a language, I guess. Um, no, well, that was pretty cool. Yeah. And I remember when you came in, you, you were asking a lot of really neat questions, um, you know, that, that showed that you were more interested in being, you know, learning what was really going on on the other side, not just how don't I get in trouble. And, and that's cool because, you know, a lot of people think that we are somehow like the sky police and that could not be further from the truth. I mean, yes, we observe things and sometimes start the process really on a deviation, but I mean, we don't actually write deviations. The FISDO does that flight standards, another part of the FAA. We don't, we don't really even want to deal with that, but the problem is we're usually just the people who get to see it. Right. So, yeah. So that's why people get afraid of us, but I mean, again, I assure you, no, no controllers out there to try to write up deviations. It's a huge pain for us too. And we just like it to not happen in the first place. Right. But yeah, but a lot of people come in with that attitude and and, and it's kind of a bummer because I don't like going to work knowing people are, you know, afraid of running afoul of me. Like I, that wouldn't make me feel good. That makes me feel terrible. So, right. yeah. So I like that when, you know, people want to come in and learn, that's really cool. Okay. So you and I started talking then and, and after I unplugged from the position and so on, we kind of went downstairs and actually were able to, you know, really talk. And where were you in your training at that point? Mm, I want to say I was maybe about 10 hours, maybe 15, um, with the flight school. And, uh, it was, it was pretty early on. Right. Right. So you had just started and for the background, you were at a, I, I wouldn't call it large, but like a medium part 141 type flight school. Right. Okay. So you were there was a lot that's good about that. And I remember you were talking about some issues you were having with it too. And of course, we're not going to name any names or anything, but um, tell me how you decided on picking a school like that and then how it went for you throughout the private. Um, well, I went, uh, it was kind of a, it was kind of a thing actually where I just walked in the door and it was the first place that I saw that said, learn to fly. And so I just walked in the door and said, I want to learn to fly. Uh, I had just moved into the area and prior to moving, I had kind of wanted to, to learn to, to learn to fly. And I decided not to because I knew I was going to be moving and I didn't want to start it and then pick up somewhere else. So before I had moved, I take, I had taken a discovery flight. So I already knew what it was like to be up in a small, uh, 172. And, uh, so I walked in the door, I said, look, I've already done the discovery flight. Let's just give me the paperwork. Let's do this thing. Put me on the schedule and, and, and let's go. And that's, um, but they just, and they just handed me, handed me the first instructor and, um, and I was up and going. So. Okay. So when you went in for your first lesson and I mean, you're already committed that, that, that by the way is sort of like the dream scenario for any flight school and flight instructor is, I mean, there, there's no sales. The, the guy's ready to go right now. Let's just let's hop in and do this. He's motivated, right? Oh yeah. I would, I would have done it five minutes later. I'm, yeah, like I'm if, like, well, I'm already here. Let's just do it right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If this was, if this was a car lot, you'd be like, sweet, I'm going out to dinner tonight after this. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. No. Okay. Well, so, all right. So you got a first instructor and, um, kind of tell me about how that started. Oh, uh, so I came in, uh, it was actually an interesting day because, uh, um, I got to, they, they gave me this, uh, they gave me an instructor and come to find out, I think I was his very first student, uh, ever. And so we go in there and we're setting up before we go on a flight, we're going to set up some stuff with, um, you know, on the FAA website and getting your, uh, uh, student pilot license and stuff like that. And then I got a friend texting me and, uh, because I had tell, told him that I had signed up and that I was ready to go fly. And so he did, had just happened to text me while we're setting this the thing up and saying, Hey, I don't think you should be flying, man. This, uh, plane just went down and at uh, John Wayne. And, um, that was the day that, it, that, that had happened. And I'm like, Oh, well, I'm already here. I'm going to just do this anyways. Was that, that was the 310 that crashed on the freeway? Yeah. It's on fire. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got him texting me. I'm like, Oh man, this is just not a good sign, but whatever. Let's just do this thing. Um, and, uh, so then we, we fill out the paperwork and then we went to go fly. And, um, and then I, I guess that was, um, okay. all right. So as you came along through your first three, four, five, ten 10 hours, you, you realized that you were this guy's first student, right? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, obviously that that's fine. Everybody has a first student. I feel terrible for my first student, so it's cool. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, tell me a little bit about how, um, how that felt for you. Uh, 
it was interesting because I had kind of expected something different. I had taken this discovery flight before I moved and the discovery flight was this with this relatively old instructor. I would say he was well into the sixties. Um, he was, I don't mean to say the sixties is relatively old, but he no, was older than a yeah, lot of these. Yeah, he, he was younger a 20 something. Going right. 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 Sure. No, and he was super nice. He was totally relaxed. We got in the plane and I don't think that plane was more than 200 feet off the ground. And he said, Hey, your controls. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Giving me controls. He's like, just don't worry about it. He said, just, just point for that cloud over there and, and, and we'll, you know, I'm, I'm here. Don't worry about it. And he went and let me flew around and, uh, it, it was, it was a great experience. Then I get in the plane with this instructor and he seems so uneasy and so nervous and the nicest guy in the world. He really was. I, I really liked him personally. Um, but, I realized very quickly that um, it was going to be kind of hard training with somebody who is so uncomfortable with anybody else controlling the plane. And so the way I looked at it was, I really like this guy. I'm comfortable with him personally, but it, it may take me a few extra hours to get my license dealing with a new instructor. But nevertheless, he knows how to, you know, he knows how to fly. He knows how to teach and so on and so forth. So I actually decided that I wanted to just go ahead and finish the process with him. Yeah. Um, we got to the point where uh, we were going through the checklist of the things you need to be able to do in order to solo. And the closer we were getting to that, the more uncomfortable I was getting with it. One, I was constantly dealing with this thing where uh, measuring up to what I thought was an acceptable amount of time that you're supposed to solo in. Sure. And I think it was at about 25 hours at this point when I was about to do my do my solo. So I'm kind of becoming frustrated with it going like, oh, I got to get this done, get it done, get it done. And at the same time, I was feeling less and less comfortable that I even belonged in the plane by myself. Interesting. Okay. I go through all these checklists and like, oh, okay, you can do the steep turns, you can do the stalls, you can do all of these things. And in the end, um, one of the stepping, uh, one of the points that you have to pass is like an oral test. And then you have to go up with a, uh, a different instructor and do a flight test before you can do the solo. And I became frustrated with the school at that point and kind of the, I hate to say it, but a bureaucracy of, of, sure. of the situation. No, that's that's what I actually, so between those combination of things, I made a decision, Hey, I need to do something different. Okay. Okay. Do you think a lot of people run through that feeling? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's maybe talk right now about your background in, in flying, because I think, this is, this is what's going to motivate or not somebody to, to come to this decision. Right. Okay. So way back in the, actually maybe not even way back, but maybe you say like 10 years ago, I remember AOPA had a whole thing about how the completion factor from people that start flight training compared to those who actually successfully complete flight training, let's just say for a private license was it's like some crazy low number. It was like less than a third end up finishing it. Right. And I know that, and I don't remember the exact number. I think the numbers have actually improved quite a bit now, but they, they were like, okay, let's look at, let's, let's study this. Why would people, why would so many people start and yet so few finish? Right. And that obviously came down to a lot of things that has a little pie chart, you know, money, uh, family issue, things like that. But, um, I feel like there's a lot of people that probably take a flight, say, Hey, this is really cool. Right. This is fun. And then. Or, or they're like, hey, I like boating. I like, you know, off-roading. Like, whatever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a pilot too. I just got to knock out these 40 hours, and then, then that's cool, right? Boom, right. We're, we're done. I fly. Right. right. So buy a plane. Let's party. So okay. And then they realize, oh my god, on their first two or three lessons, like I'm in way over my head. Like this is 10,000 times more complicated and possibly less fun than I thought. Very and so they so. just decide, okay, maybe this isn't for me, and that's fine. I mean, whatever. It's a personal choice. As long as you don't feel like it's been taken from you, I think is kind of what it is. But, but then there's this, this other group of people that, um, and assuming you don't like run out of money or something weird like that, why is there still this huge percentage of people not finishing? And what it came down to was there's a lot of reasons people get, I guess, frustrated and give up. And, and I'm, I'm glad that you didn't quit, but you knew that something probably needed to change at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk about how you got there. So for you, why did you want to fly in the first place? 
I didn't actually think I ever wanted to fly. Um, the first time I was ever on a commercial plane, I was an adult, so I never flew when I was younger. And then once I started flying um, as an adult for work or different reasons, I never enjoyed flying at all. Um, I hated going to the airport. I didn't like being herded around like by cattle. Sure. So um, the, the desire to fly actually came from not wanting to be in an airport and not being in that situation. Uh, the other thing was, is I moved to San Diego where my business is in Ventura County and um, I could only get to Ventura County in a reasonable amount of time at night. Um, so I would usually leave here at seven o'clock at night. I'd end up in Ventura County around 10 o'clock at night, get a hotel. And then I realized I'm like, hey, you know, this plane idea is really cool. I can just fly over the traffic. I can be there in an hour and I can, I can, you know, leave after breakfast, you know, I have breakfast at home with my kids. I can go to work, work all day and I can still be home by dinner. I'm like, this is, this is way awesome. I, you know, this is a great thing to do. There's so, no more gratifying. Well, maybe not no more, but <laughs> with your clothes on, there's no more gratifying <laughs> feeling than looking down at LA traffic from an airplane. Oh yeah. What. Oh no, that is, yeah. that is phenomenal. I, I, I almost, I, I'm sitting there looking for the traffic all the time just yeah. because I get a kick out of it. Yeah, no, it's funny. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're definitely not a, I've had the passion for flying from childhood type person. You are, you're very much more of a, a pragmatic. This would affect my business positively. Give me more family time. Um, basically just put more hours on the clock in the day. Right. Okay. So for and you, it's fun. Yeah, well, of course, no, and, and then, <laughs> no, well, I'm glad you came to the realization that it is actually fantastic too. So, yeah. okay, cool. No, that's good. And all right. So, so your motivation was, was obviously different than, you know, some, you know, teenager or 20 something that wants to do this as a career. Right. So, you know, when you decided to pull the plug on a, like a 141 type school and then move over to a flying club, what were you looking to find at the club? I just knew that I needed something different and I was hoping to find a, maybe less bureaucratic, um, and, and not to say that their, their system isn't good and it might be good for some people. Uh, I think it depends on I think it also depends on where your instructor stands at that school. Okay. So if your instructor has been there for a while and he's got kind of better standing, then he kind of gets a better time or he gets more time with the head instructors to do the check, the check ride, stuff like that. So I think there was a little bit of an issue with, with that. Um, and I was just looking to, I was actually really not enjoying what I was doing. And I said, you know what, this, I, I like flying. It's fun, but I'm not enjoying this process anymore. And so I said, you know what? I really just need to make a, ch make a change. So, okay. No, that's fair. And I'm glad that you did because then you continued on to completion. Yeah. Right. Okay. So here we are. And, uh, you're looking at purchasing it or, or you did just purchase an aircraft recently. I did. Well, what, make us all jealous. What'd you get? <laughs> Cirrus SR-22, 2005. Cool. Very cool. Now that that's one of those airplanes right now, speaking of, I think it might've been ALPA or one of the magazines out there had the whole article about airplanes that were once just top of the line technology, very, very, very expensive airplanes that have now come down into the within reach, you know, like a sub $200,000 airplanes. So now there are a lot of really good airplanes out there as Cirruses, Columbia's, things like that, that are, that are fast. Um, and that, you know, for those of us that have been around for more than even a few years, we're, you know, always at the top of their game. Cirrus is of course, fantastic airplanes, fast, beautiful to look at. Um, whatever you want. It's got it. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, I feel like you've gone through a process that a lot of people kind of had. And and that's why, you know, for everyone listening, of course, too, you know, we, we, we've met and talked more than that one time at the tower. And I remember when you were um, sort of struggling with what to do, we, we talked a little bit and, and so on. And uh, you went back and listened to previous episodes of this particular podcast where I had talked to um, the president of a flight club, the founder of a flight school, things like that. And you were telling me that that kind of helped you make a decision. What were you looking to find when you got to the club? I mean, obviously you were looking to find more experience and so on, but in your own words, what kind of put you over the edge to try it, that style of training instead? Um, I realized real quickly after starting that, and this isn't a, a knock on a, on the schools or in any, in any way, and I'm not saying that this is the, this is the way the schools are handled entirely or, or any one particular school or schools in general, um, but I found that the majority of the flight instructors at the school were kind of using that as like a little bit of a parking spot until they could get to a commercial job. I think teaching is a, one of those very highly respectable things. And it's not because, 
only some people can do it, it's because only some people want to do it. And you have to want to do it in order to be good at it. And I, yes. and I, and I was like, you know what? I really, um, uh, I, I really felt like I wanted somebody to, to, to enjoy teaching. And I didn't think that they were actually enjoying teaching that much. I think they were just sitting there trying to log the hours in order to be able to, and I'm not saying that it was a horrible attitude. I'm not trying to make it sound more dramatic than it was. It just wasn't the feeling that I was really looking for. And I wanted to get back to enjoying the flying. Of course. So. And of course, none of this conversation to, you know, for, for anybody is, is, a knock on, you know, club is bad, club is good, or 141 school is bad, 141 yeah, school is good. Yeah. It's not, I'm not trying to slam anybody, yeah, no. but there is a difference. Like, well, I mean, yeah, it's like that, you know, even in, in, in all kinds of relationships in the world. I mean, you know, you're, when you're learning to fly, you're going to get in, you're going to get down and dirty. I mean, frankly, like you're getting in a sweaty, loud little airplane and, and some person is going to start learning all kinds about, about you, about the way you get when you're frustrated, about the way you get when you're overwhelmed about the way, I mean, personal stuff's going to come into it. Right. So you're hiring someone on that's going to have a remarkably personal, close relationship with you. And you don't really know that going in sometimes. No, and so it's no, very, that, yeah. Yeah, and it's very important that the person that you're training with is, is a good fit. And it's very common to, to switch instructors. And a lot of times, you know, if you're feeling like, Hey, this instructor might not be working out for me. Well, oftentimes the instructor is kind of feeling like, Hey, this guy maybe should go fight with someone else too. So the instructor and the student both need to be very happy with where they are. Cause if they're not, and one of those cylinders isn't firing, then you don't have a relationship, right? right? Even if you're both great people, one might be a very good instructor. You might be a very good student, but for some reason there's some little soft personality clash there and something even that small, uh, maybe it's a question of motivation too. You know, you, you're looking for sage advice and they're looking for, you know, young go get a professional. That's what I got to give. Right. And that's right. just, a difference of what one person has to offer versus what one person needs. So again, when we're having this conversation, you know, and the reason I was so anxious to record this with you is that, you know, through the courses of our conversations over the last few months, I, I just keep getting this feeling that you're not the only person that's going through stuff like this, or that's, that's having these thoughts of like, okay, how am I matching up to other people? How am I, the relationship with an instructor, what would that really look like if it was really good? And all I can feel though, is that something isn't quite right and I want to do the right thing, but now I don't really know where that is and, and, and so on, because a lot of schools can get very tight. You know, they, they, there's a, there's a syllabus, there's a whatever, and it's a business and that's fine. And for the kids going to the airlines, I mean, that is, that that's frankly a very good setup because right. that's what it's going to be. Right. But then, um, you know, clubs also, and we talked about this, um, back with, uh, back with Jeff in episode, I think three, it was, uh, you know, some schools or I'm sorry, clubs are the wild west. You know, it's some guy and yeah, I'm a CFI, whatever, right, you know, right. let's go fly this old rust bucket and I'll yeah. teach you. It's cool. And then other ones are, are very, you know, together and they've, they've really got a good thing going. Right. So when you came to the, the or when you found the club that you found, tell me about how your thoughts changed, how you felt, were you, were you satisfied with it or how did it work? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up the, the advice kind of part of it because, so I went over, I went over to the club, I got set up with an instructor and I went to, I, I explained to him where I was at. I told him I'm like right at the point where I'm, I'm supposed to do the solo. And, and I told him, I said, I don't really even feel like I'm, you know, should be in a plane by myself. I didn't really have the confidence that I, that I, that I needed to have at that point. And one of the, so I came, I met with him and he kind of walked, Oh, that was the other thing is that I was changing planes at the same time too. Okay. So he wanted to train me in the Piper Cherokee opposed to the Cessna 172. Okay. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm game for a change, you know, and I'd love to fly a low wing plane because I've been curious what it was, what that was like. And so he says, okay, well, let's take up this Piper Cherokee and go fly around and see if you're comfortable with me. And, and then we can go from there. So I meet with him, we walk around the plane and, you know, do, do a pre-flight and we go fly. And he's very, um, uh, but during this pre-flight, let me jump back a little bit. During this pre-flight process, I was asking him some other questions and he had asked me why I wanted to fly. And I said, well, for work purposes and I want to buy a plane. And he asked about what kind of plane that I wanted to buy. And, um, and then just came out with this floodgates of information about different planes. I was in love with this 
immediately because this was all kinds of information that I couldn't get before. All that sage advice you were looking for is now just yeah. drenching you. Oh, a- he started talking about the weight and balance sure. and the performance and sure. the engines and the seating and this reason and that reason. I'm like, oh my God. And I would ask all kinds of questions to the instructors when I was at the school. But all most of these instructors were brand new pilots. They you know, basically went through the steps to become a CFI and then they were doing that. Most of them had never flown anything other than, you know, a 172 or, you know, something that was used in the training where this guy all of a sudden knew about all kinds of different planes and all kinds of different reasons of things to look at. So I, I was in love with that right away. Okay, cool. Uh, then we, so we went to go fly and I fell in love with the Piper Cherokee. I was just overwhelmed at how nice of a plane it was. And I'm not saying anything about, you know, I know 172s are great planes, but I was like, no, I don't enjoy that anymore. This is way, way nicer and more fun to fly and uh, seemed a little bit more agile. It was a little bit faster. I love the low wing, the visibility that you have above. You could, you know, looking for planes and traffic and stuff. I loved being in the low wing plane. He was very relaxed, totally let me control the plane. Uh, I even, if I remember correctly, I even took off in this plane that I'd never flown before. And, um, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm really, and, and nothing, there was no real instruction that went on whatsoever. And, um, and I was like, oh, I'm totally comfortable with this guy. He seems totally relaxed with me being in the plane. I says, okay, great. Let's go ahead and start training. And, uh, then the next lesson is when everything changed. Um, he was clearly playing very nice and, you know, and just like, yo, okay, we're going to go on a nice little, nice little ride and stuff. And the next lesson that I did, he was like, okay, well, we're going to do this, uh, uh, in, engine out emergency landings. And I said, okay, well, you know, we're not actually going to land the plane, you know, with, without the engine. He's like, yeah, yeah, we are. And I says, okay, well, he said, didn't you do this before? I said, no. And he says, you know, I said, we'd gone down to maybe, you know, thousand feet, 500 feet, something like that. Oh, okay. Well, we picked our best field, blah, blah, blah. And, and then we, and we took off again. He's like, no, no, that's not how it works. If your engine's out, you're, you're done. You got to figure out how to get that thing on the ground. And so he clearly knew that I didn't know how to handle the plane. And, um, so he, he showed me how to, he showed me how to do it. And it was quite, it was, it was very aggressively done. So it was, uh, very steep S turns, very steep banks, and then just came in at the field, um, at, at an, at an angle on a shorter runway on a, you know, 2,700 foot runway and came in at an angle and just, and, and glided that thing down. Um, and he's like, this is, this is what you need to be able to do. After that moment, I was like, I had everything made sense all of a sudden. It was like, okay, great. I found an instructor. He was trying to tell me you need to own the plane. You need to be in full control and and make that thing do what you want it to do. And I realized that I wasn't ready to solo, that if I couldn't maneuver a plane properly in the way that like he was showing me, then I didn't belong doing my solo that I was pushing so hard to get to. And from that point on, I stopped caring about how many hours I was, it was going to take me to get to my solo. I was, I stopped caring about how many hours it was going to take me to get to my uh, to get the license. I was all, I was all of a sudden interested in just, I want to learn to fly right. Okay. So your, your motivation, I'm going to go out and say it right now, because I know everyone's thinking it, you got your motivation, right? Yeah. Like that's what it was. You, you weren't playing for score anymore. You were playing to learn the craft yes. and then all of those things will follow. Yes. I was, I wasn't looking to check a box anymore. I wasn't looking to beat a certain amount of hours. I wasn't looking and, and you go online and you're looking for information and you know, you, you start worrying that you're taking too many hours to solo. And so you start looking at it and then you go online and everybody's, well, I, I did it in 12 hours. I did it in four and a half. I mean, what, whatever. It was just one ridiculous thing after the next where somebody's trying to brag and it wasn't really telling you that it wasn't so many hours as you know, you need to be comfortable to do so. Right. Well, those people we like to call, uh, I think the official term is a liar. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They, I mean, there are people that, that did solo in 12 hours, I'm sure. But, you know, in, in around here, at least that's not going to happen just because everything here is, you know, so complicated. You're at a very busy, highly controlled airport, very, you know, busy airspace. You can't just go four miles away, do your maneuvers and come back. I mean, you need to go to a practice area that's 15 miles away. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it is rare to see someone around here solo in that amount of time. And, you know, as somebody who gets to watch this stuff happen all day long, every day, I can tell you that you don't want to have soloed in 12 hours. No. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the guy who soloed in 12 hours, what the road you were going down where you, you just, I, I feel like you naturally knew you weren't ready. Yeah. That guy's not ready, but he didn't make the same choice you did. And he went for it, you know, and true luck is probably going to be on their side. But if something really did happen, as you found out, 
that guy probably doesn't have the ownership he needs of the situation, right? You know, be it physically or mentally, it's going to get ugly real fast. Okay. So yeah, and that's an amazing point to make, you know, is just like anything, whether it's learning to play a sport or an instrument or do this, anything that's as complicated, you, you have to just do it you have to learn the craft and then all the numbers will follow later. Right. I mean, I think business is probably the same way. Learn the business, learn the trade, learn the whatever, and then the numbers will follow. And, and it's amazing how much actually looked, how about you put it in your own words? How did your training change after you got that right? Um, I felt far, far more comfortable in the air. Um, and, and then once I got to the solo, I, I, every time I got up in the air, I could look down I could find it. It didn't have to be the runway. It could have been the beach. It could have been a field. It could have been, I did look there and I could say, I know how to get this plane on the ground. And I didn't feel like I was doing something stupid, um, as much as I did before, before every time I looked down, I said, if this engine fails, I, yeah, I mean, I know how to glide this thing down, but you know, whether I'm going to survive this thing is, is very questionable. And after I learned how to, you know, do these emergency landings properly. Um, I, I looked down and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And I felt good. I felt okay with what I was doing again. So I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was, it was definitely a great experience. Okay. Well, that's perfect. And then I, I guess that's kind of the, the point or one of the points, I mean, we can probably make a little bullet list of all the points to take away from this talk we've had even up to this point, but you know, when you're, when you're picking a school or you're picking an instructor, you know, it needs to just be the right match. And it's one of those things where, I don't know, it's been a long time since I was dating, but I feel like, you, you know, when you're with someone that's pretty cool and they're a great person or whatever, but just something isn't there, it's just missing. Right. You, you, you are not going to have a future there. There just isn't. And it, it, it's sometimes it's kind of hard to break that off though. It, it, it could just maybe just fear of it being awkward. Maybe it could be anything, you know, you just don't want to do it. Maybe I'm lazy, but to break off that relationship and go find one that does have a future, it, even when you don't know when you're going to find it or what it's going to look like, you still have to do it because I mean, in this case, it, it could have been your safety. It could have been your life. And and so you needed to get that thing right in your head. And by finding the right thing for you, you got there. Yeah. Right. And then for, um, you know, fun little side note, I'm actually working with a person right now who is, I think the, the 141 training environment is perfect for him. He wants there to be a I want to know what we're doing today. I want to know how I matched up. I want to have my lesson for next time written right here. I want to know what to study. And, you know, he really wants it spoon fed. Right. So for this guy, he's going to thrive in a 141 environment far better. So I guess maybe I'm just making a long disclaimer here, but none of this conversation is to say that flight school is good or bad. Club is good or bad. Buy an airplane and hire an instructor is good or bad. Of all the ways you do it, it doesn't matter. It's just that you do the right thing for you. Yeah, and and that's a that's a that's a big thing. Sure, and and having the right, I mean, having the right instructor. Now, I I think I got the greatest instructor in the world. I like, I was so thrilled to to have him teach me. But I can clearly see how he's not going to be a great instructor for somebody else. You know, sure. um, he's not. Uh, he wasn't very soft about things. You know, and when you screwed up, he was kind of kind of abrasive about things now for me that was okay i i liked the the way he conversated and the way he explained things to me you know and, and stuff like that was um definitely got sometimes on the you know on the i guess on the abrasive side of things but it, i was like okay great just tell me i screwed up that's fine i want to know i mean don't don't candy coat this at all no you just totally jack this thing up you know mm -hmm. i just let me know and let me fix it and he was, and that was great for me, but where somebody else I could see, well, you know, they might want somebody to come in a little bit, you know, a little bit easier. So yeah, a little softer everybody's going to be a little different, whether it be the 141 school or, uh, you know, or, or one instructor or new instructor, young instructor, old instructor, or, you know, experience, whatever. There's all kinds of different angles of this that just get comfortable is the one thing I would say. There was, de there was definitely some major steps along the way, chronologically. One is obviously getting to the, getting to the point of doing the solo scared the hell out of me. Um, the the next point I specifically remember was the first time that I came to the airport to solo by myself. And, you know, here I got the key to the plane. And so do you want, do you want to talk about this a, yeah, a little bit? Okay. Absolutely. I do. Okay. Cause guess what? I still remember the first time I drove to the airport by myself to fly an airplane by myself. I mean, I, it was 23 years ago and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's okay. That's, you know what? That's great to know because I feel that I, I felt like when I was when I was going through this process that I'm like, oh, man, I'm 
such a, a, a chicken shit about this or, you know, that I, I, I know how to do this. I've been through so many hours of training. This should be, you know, this should be okay to me. And, and it wasn't. So I, the, so the solo was obviously a big step. And, but at the same time I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do this. My instructor was right there. We'd already been flying for a couple of hours. Um, although I was one of the things that I do, um, and I think people should know is that this is training to fly is a mentally fatiguing thing. I would be exhausted after, you know, two, two and a half hours of flying or something. I was tired. And by the end of your, this time, um, you, uh, you start to make mistakes. I think after some, after a couple hours, because your, your, uh, your body just, your mind just gets tired of it. <laughs> it's the way it goes. Um, but anyway, so you go to do the, so you go to do the solo. That was, that was a significant point. One of the things that I, I also found to be something I wish somebody would have told me is that when you do go to do your first solo, you're a way better pilot than when you're with your instructor, because it's a life or death situation all of a sudden. And you're, instincts just kick in and you just do things better. Actually, I was kind of surprised at how well I did handle that plane on that first time that I solo. So the next major time that was I had soloed, uh, once and it was just two laps in the, in the pattern. And then the next time I flew, I went to two other airports and soloed at both of those airports and got cleared to solo in those places. The next time I flew, I came to the airport, I scheduled a time for the plane. First thing in the morning, I was hoping the winds were going to be calm, everything, you know, looking for the ideal situation. And I said, I'm just going to come up, come to the airport and I'm going to uh, do the traffic pattern and touch and goes. So um, I did. And I know I didn't sleep well the night before because I was nervous were totally shot, but I told myself, I got to go do this. And I came and I did it. And I think I did four landings and I said, I'm done. I'm I'm, I just need, I just can't do, I, I don't need to be doing this anymore today. <laughs> and so then I came and I parked the plane. I was happy to be back on the ground. And I think the next time after I flew with my instructor after that, so it gave me a little bit more, you know, a little bit more confidence. Uh, I think I came in again the next time where I actually left the traffic pattern and I went, you know, I think up the coast a little bit and then uh, messed around and then came back very short flight. I'm going to probably say 30 minutes at the, at the most, you know, which was, I, I needed to take these steps in order to be able to, to get comfortable with it. Um, and then I think the next time that was a major step was when I decided that I was more relaxed in the airplane, not having my instructor with me than with having him with me because I was like, okay, I know what to do, but he's giving me so many damn things to do that he's, you know, which is great because, you know, you're making sure that you can handle what you're supposed to handle. But at the same time, I'm like, it's now more relaxing for me to fly by myself than it is with him. <laughs> so Amazing how fast that did a little switcheroo, isn't it? Yeah, because I was like, God, don't leave me in this plane by myself, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. And then the next time I'm like, yeah, okay, you can go. It's, it's you know, it's nice, calm and relaxing when you're out here. But when you're here, he's like, okay, do this, do this. We're going to, okay, great, emergency landing, whatever. And, you know, kind of switching things up so fast on me that I could just go out and fly by myself and do some stalls and steep turns and whatever. And I'm kind of doing everything at my leisure. It was pretty relaxing. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing how you're, it's just, again, it's like, I keep saying it's, it's that question of, of your motivation, you know, and not, not, am I motivated? Like, do I have the energy or something, but like the why, like when you find your, your why, that's when it all comes together. And you, so you're like, why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? What's going to make me feel good about doing this, mm -hmm. getting to that level of personal accomplishment where you do feel good about it and you can get up and do it without, freaking out about it and and you're flying with a person who now you trust their judgment so you're like when he says i'm good i know i'm performing at the level i need to be yeah and then you believe it yourself yeah and then you're there as opposed to when you don't trust that person's judgment and you because i can just sense that you were struggling for something and you didn't know what it was but you're like it more or less i think it's fair to say now comes down to I don't trust this guy's judgment enough and he may say I'm ready to solo, but I don't feel it. But to get yourself over that hump of where you do believe it, that's not going to get you there. You needed somebody who you do respect and trust right. to 
convince you so that you can convince yourself. And then guess what? It was great. And you did, you did great. And, yeah. and, and you're, you're comfortable with it. And in four flights, you went from, Oh my God, Oh my God. To like, I'm going to go fly now. Yeah. And, and I'd rather do it by myself actually, if that's cool with you. So, you know, whatever, I got the key, right. let's book it and come out and fly. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I, lo- I loved it. It was, yeah. it was a very, that was a very exciting. That was, that was, it was still, and I'm, I'll, I'll tell you, I still get pretty, um, I, I still lose some sleep on some nights before I'm going to fly. Um, I was, uh, a couple days ago, I, uh, flew to Ventura County for the second time. Mm-hmm. And, um, I know before I, before I, left. I didn't sleep that well the night before. It's still a little bit disconcerting to sure. me, um, making sure that I'm dealing with the traffic, right. And, uh, getting across the, the, the class Bravo airspace and the special flight rules route and stuff sure. like that, going over the mountains and the Mal, you know, in the Malibu stuff like that. Um, one day I flew the big bear, same thing again. I told myself the day before I was going to fly the big bear. I booked the plane, but I'm, just not sure about it. I had never even flown, uh, you know, at 10,000 feet before. And right, then, right. so everything, there's constantly these new, I think it's a really a process. You have to get comfortable with a lot of different aspects of it. Absolutely. Just getting a license just doesn't, um, I don't know. It, yeah. Well, so now that you're fresh off getting your license, here, here's a statement for you, true or false. You know, they always say that when you get your private license, it's just a license to learn. Mm-hmm. What say you? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's amazing how much this whole process has humbled me. I, I really went into it coming to the airport and looking at these old planes or old design planes, you know, and going like, oh, look, it's a lawnmower with wings. And this is the, how hard could this thing be? You know, it just it seems like the easiest thing in the world. And um, and then you get into it. You're like, wow, there's just a lot to learn. And then even after you get your license, you're like, damn, I I'm, I have so far to go. Right. Well, now as an aircraft owner with a with a license and you're working on getting that instrument rating, I mean, it by the time you finish that, you're going to look at how far you've come in this just one year period and, and not even believe the way you saw the sky and the world and aviation and airplanes just one year before. Oh yeah. It, it's incredible how much it changes you. And then, but yeah, just like anything, it's, it's a huge process that, you know, the, it's not the end goal that matters. Like the process is the important part. And then that's where you learn all those lessons that you then take with you in whatever you decide to do with it afterwards. Doesn't right. really matter. But going through that process and having that experience is what, what was the important part. And then the license and the certificates or whatever, the ratings, they all follow that. But yeah. it's not when you're, but when you're playing to get the certificate, it's way harder than playing to learn the craft. And then the certificate follows. Yeah. The, the, the idea of checking the boxes is just not the, the right mentality. And that's the mentality I went into it with. I'm like, okay, you know, do this, do this. Great. Give me a license and let me go. And it's just not the, it's not, it's not the same as really feeling like you're definitely in control of, of the airplane. Man, that was a good talk. And you know what? Before we go, you thought I forgot, didn't you? Yeah. Who won the airway manual binder? Right. Well, congrats to the patron who left a really nice comment on Instagram, Brian Juarez. He put up a photo of his view while he waited for a flight out of Denver. It was out the window of a 747, and he said, uh, listening to the latest podcast from Podcasting on a Plane with the Queen of the Skies. And for my hashtag AvGeek friends, or anyone really, definitely check out Brandon's podcast. Well, Brian, thanks for the awesome comment, and I hope to see lots of pictures on Instagram and Facebook of this airway manual getting beat up in the cockpit of something in the near future. So thank you to Brian and, of course, all of my show patrons. You're amazing people, and I'm grateful for each and every one of your contributions to the show. And you can look forward to more giveaways and some really fun patron-only content coming in the near future. And real quick, before we finish up here, I was asked a little bit ago about um, how you record something if you want to leave a comment for me to play on the show, but you don't know how to do it. Well, how do you record something like a question or comment to have on the show? Well, the easiest way is open up the Voice Memos app on your phone. There should be some sort of native voice recording app, no matter what kind of phone you have. On an iPhone, it's called Voice Memos, and on an Android... Uh, there's one, it's usually, I think it's called Voice Recorder. And if not, uh, don't worry about it. Just go to the, whatever your app store is and download one. Most of them have some sort of light version that's free anyway. And just hit record. You can say whatever you want to say. And when you're done, it'll make your recording into a file that you can just email. So email to me straight from your phone and you're done. Remember a couple episodes back, listener Dave Abbey sent me a really cool recording while he was plane spotting at JFK? Well, he had the ATC on the background, and it was it was really awesome. So wherever you are in the world, you can share your aviation moment with me and the whole podcasting on a plane community. And I don't know, maybe you just passed that check ride, or you just got that first job in the industry, bought your first airplane, whatever. Record it, and I'll share it with everyone. You know, we're all in this together, and I can't think of a better group to share your experience or comment with. 
So if you have suggestions for show topics or individuals you want me to interview or social media you want me to share, go ahead and say something. If you want to set up an instructional or mentoring session, head over to podcastingonaplane.com slash contact and we can set it up. And if you find value in the podcast and you want to support the show, you can check out patreon.com slash podcastingonaplane or podcastingonaplane.com slash support. Either way, you can see future goals for the show and you can find out how you can become a valued supporter. And lastly, iTunes ranks its podcast largely based on reviews. And I'd really appreciate it if you could head over there and leave one. It's totally free and it'll go a long way to help others find the podcast so we can grow our community and promote this great thing we call aviation for everyone. Well, that's all for now. Thanks again for listening. Your frequency change is approved until next time. And report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day. Casting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. My comments and those of my guests, the website's content, and any of the social media, etc. are not part of my official responsibility as a controller or an FA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are mine and those of my guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. There is no nexus between podcasting on a plane and the FAA. Also, while I am a CFI, I'm not your CFI. Nor am I your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink, or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie, and fun, but is in no way, shape, or form professional advice. It's not legal counsel, and it's definitely not flight instruction. If you are in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be.